ಆಗೋಯ್ತು ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಆಯ್ತಾ ನಿಂದು In South India, 80 miles west of Bangalore, this windmill pumps drinking water for a group of scientists who are trying to help India's rural poor. The windmill works perfectly. It can be built by local craftsmen and it needs very little maintenance. But it costs 150 pounds. and this means it's a failure only a rich man can afford one the windmill symbolizes the difficulties facing these scientists and engineers they belong to a group called astra the initial stand for the application of science and technology to rural areas the members all spend part of the year here at astra's field research station how do we solve the question of uh, giving them tools astra is the creation of this man amulya reddy he studied at imperial college london and he's now professor of chemistry at the indian institute of science in bangalore keeps a track of where each tool goes this film is about professor reddy his colleagues and their attempt to understand and solve some of the problems of village india science and technology in india needs uh, a reorientation in my view uh because it has largely ignored uh, the problems of the rural areas and particularly the rural poor and it has concentrated very much uh on particular aspects of industrial development uh and so a number of basic minimum needs of the people have not been looked into by science and technology for instance uh, drinking water uh, basic problems of sanitation and so on india's population is now 650 million and it's increasing at the rate of a million a month 80% of the people live in villages where the way of life has hardly changed in a thousand years. After independence, India looked to science and technology as the way out of its backwardness. Only science it seemed could provide the food, health, industry and prosperity which could stop the drift towards violent revolution in the late 1950s and early 60s indian documentary films like this one spelt out the future no nation can consume more than it produces our country is striving to raise the living standards of our people we must produce more and more to speedier industrialization then alone can we cope with the ever increasing demands of our huge population This massive effort demands the wholehearted cooperation of the nation. The task is colossal, but we are sure of achieving it. India is determined that she will not lag behind advanced nations, that her industrial base must be expanded. It is a conviction shared by working people all over our land who can see the future being sketched before them and for them. A future in which men and women will not work for machines and money. but machines and money will work for them in the 60s uh, it was thought that science and technology will pull not only india but all developing countries out of their conditions of poverty but i think early in the 70s it was realized that this was not happening that in fact uh, uh the greater the emphasis on industry the greater was the gap between the rich and the poor and uh it uh was realized that this was primarily because uh, uh if science and technology is only related to a certain pattern of industrial development and that pattern of industrial development is only related to the needs of the more affluent 
then it will not touch the problems in the poor, of the poor and therefore not make an impact on poverty. Poverty is highly photogenic, which obscures the undramatic and depressing reality. For India's rural poor, poverty simply means no rest, no let up from the hard grind of staying alive. In this part of India, the farmers grow rice and a little sugar cane. But the staple diet is ragi, a kind of millet. In the west, it's fed to budgerigars. These labourers come from Pura village, where Professor Reddy and the Astra team are doing most of their work. This year, the monsoon rains have come and gone, and conditions are relatively easy. Pura is better off than other parts of India. Well, the land here may look rich, but actually this is considered a drought-prone area, which means that most of the agriculture here is dependent on the rain. And so once every five years when the rain fails, there is a drought. So it's the lack of water which makes it a poor place. 360 people live here in Pura. The village has electricity, but only a few of the 56 households can afford even the cost of a meter. Most use paraffin for lighting and firewood for cooking. There's no running water, no sanitation. Most of the people are Hindu, a religion which teaches passive acceptance of one's lot. There are half a million villages in India, just like Pura. They have very few possessions, uh, but the possessions that they do have, a few pots and pans, are very precious to them. You can see that they are, if not below the poverty level, certainly on the borderline. When one goes around the village, uh, what uh, uh, upsets you is that such villages can continue to exist in a, a country which is otherwise industrially fairly advanced. Uh, you cannot uh, believe that uh, a country which uh, has put up a satellite uh, permits uh, a village like this to continue to exist.
There may be several reasons why rural problems have been uh, neglected. First of all, the bulk of science and technology in India is uh, linked to science and technology in the West. And uh, in the West, the type of minimum needs problems that we are talking about were solved 50 years ago, and nobody looks at these problems there. The second reason is that scientists uh, in India largely come from social groups which have got alienated from the rural poor. Most of us scientists are so alienated from the problems of the people. In fact, many of us are more familiar with UK or with uh, North America. We felt that we would never even begin to understand these problems and get a feel for them unless we have direct interaction and direct contact with the people. It's reckoned that half the water pumps in India are out of order at any one time. Astra took the trouble to examine 38 broken pumps and found a common fault, a loose nut in the plunger assembly. In India, a pump is used far more than in the West, by the whole village, all day long. Simple modifications and maintenance will extend the working life of a hand pump from two weeks to a year and a half. Astra are training villagers to repair their own pumps, but here in Pura, a working hand pump won't make that much difference to life. The pump water is so brackish that it can be used only for washing. The villagers have to fetch their drinking water from a pond half a mile away. The pond collects rainwater, which must last all year. The animals use it. It's muddy, but the villagers have no choice. When Astra first came to Pura, they were fairly confident of their ability to find rapid solutions to mundane problems like water supply. They looked into Western ideas for various appropriate technologies for the third world. But they found that what may seem appropriate in a laboratory in London or California is often quite useless in India. We must realize that the word, uh, the term appropriate technology has no um, uh, content in, in itself unless one defines appropriate to what. Indian windmills have to be basically different from windmills uh, abroad for two reasons. One is Indian winds are much slower. The average wind speed here may be 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. Indian winds blow only for a short period in the year. They are mostly pre-monsoon winds for a couple of months. This means that windmills are not turning for about eight months in a year. So what you require is a windmill uh, which has a low first cost, uh, not so much a windmill which has a high efficiency. So even if you sacrifice a little efficiency, it's important to have a very inexpensive windmill. And therefore, if you just transfer the windmill from, say, Europe or North America to India, it would be most inappropriate. Hey! It took some time for Astra to find out what is and what is not appropriate. The scientists had to learn a certain degree of humility and respect for traditional village technologies. The case of the bullock cart is a classic illustration. There are 13 million bullock carts in India. 11 of them are in Pura. Their design seems crude and inefficient. They're apparently an obvious candidate for improvement. Much of the bullock cart research has proceeded in the wrong direction because they've not looked at the actual needs. Let's consider how can we improve the bullock cart. You immediately say, what is required in a bullock cart is better bearings, a greater load-bearing capacity, less shocks and vibrations, etc. You come up with bullock carts with improved bearings, pneumatic tires, and in this process, you find that all the bullock cart improvements have led to an increase in the cost of the bullock cart, perhaps doubling its cost. 
And the worst thing you can do is to increase the cost of the bullock cart. The bulk of the bullock carts are used for carrying produce from the farm to the house. You find that the loads carried never exceed 500 kilograms. Therefore, greater load-bearing capacity than this is totally unnecessary. These bullock carts have to go on unprepared terrains. And therefore, if the wheels don't execute a great deal of play and oscillation, you'll find that the stresses imposed at the bearing services uh, will be extremely high. So when you see a bullock cart being used in rural areas, you have to see it as a vehicle which has evolved over many centuries and has taken almost the optimum form. In the past, I would almost say the remote past, the economy of villages was such that uh, most of them were almost uh, self-sufficient, if not a single village, at least a cluster of villages. They produced their own cloth, they had their own smith, they had their wheelwright and uh, oil crushing. Almost all the required needs of the place were generated within the place. We have found that they are able to educate us a great deal with regard to the rationality of their decisions and choices. The technologies that they have have been arrived at by a long process of natural selection of innovations, centuries of natural selection. And it seems that all the ineffective solutions were bound to have been weeded out in the course of this evolutionary process. has been done over the past five years by groups such as Astra is throwing up a new approach. And this new approach is whatever technical ability you have, whatever institutions you have, you commit them to, to the problems of the environment. And instead of the West being the best teacher, the environment becomes the best teacher. And through your commitment to the environment, you start acquiring a capability which you would never have acquired by other methods. The philosophical basis of our approach is to first study the lives of the people, from this study to identify their needs, to define what characteristics technologies must have if they are to satisfy these needs, and only then to go about generating these technologies. This seems obvious, but it is not the pattern which is usually followed. The conventional pattern is to sit in urban environments and to more or less imagine what the needs are and go about developing technologies and then trying to impose the technologies. ಅಡ್ಗೆ <laughs> <laughs> We have not gone with a solution and therefore put ourselves in the position of teachers. We have put ourselves in the position of students and in that position they are very keen on explaining why they do things. 
you go and talk to them in the village, you ask them, they tell you so many problems. They say, we don't have electricity, we don't have this, we don't have that, you know. It's just that no. they, don't, they don't have anybody to... I mean, nobody comes and asks them. When you go and, for instance, he's made a survey, he takes his notebook and goes there and says, what are your problems? Then the housewife comes and says, look, my uh, kitchen is very smoky, there's a lot of smoke. I want a chula which has a chimney or something. You know, like that. There are a lot of problems like that. Yeah, this is what, you know, you and I want to stress, the Nastra's philosophy. You know, we don't want to say sitting in Bangalore, I know what's the problem in Ungra, what's the problem in Pura. We don't want to say that. That's what many people do, you know, the many institutions where sitting in cities in the, you know, air-conditioned laboratories, they say, you know, I know what's good for them, I know what's the problem out there. But we don't say that. We come, we come down here, you know, we go with a very open mind to the village. See, the thing is, I've been brought up in a totally urban setting. I've never been in a village for this long and did not know what, what exactly a village was and the problems and things like that. And I'm relatively a baby of this team, you know. I'm just eight months old in this group. And, and after coming here, I find that uh, there's so many things which I'd, I'd never seen in cities, which uh, totally, which I never gave any thought, you know. After coming here, I've been thinking about these problems and I feel that whatever I've studied, I should try to apply them in a village rather than working in, in cities. <laughs> Please remember that we are not attempting to understand the problems of the people the way a novelist does or the way a poet does. We want to understand really the technical component of the problem because that is what we can uh, do something about. And I feel that this technical aspect of problems is something which we can comprehend with our training and with a certain degree of empathy for the people. I, this empathy, I think, is as important as the technical competence. <laughs> Identification of the real needs of the people is not a trivial matter. There is almost no data available. Therefore, in almost every problem that we have looked at, whether it's energy or water or uh, housing, we have really had to start from zero. We discovered that it's not enough to simply adopt a questionnaire approach by asking how many kilograms of firewood they use because very often they cannot relate what they use to kilograms. So you had to ask the question in an appropriate way, like uh, how many head loads of firewood do you use uh, per week? And then you had to weigh the head loads and start arriving at uh, numbers. So basically our approach in the data gathering phase 
has been a combination of questionnaires, measurements, and observations. Astra have gathered a vast amount of data on daily life in Pura. Their studies show how there's no time or energy for anything more interesting or creative than basic survival. Each day, each family has to collect about 20 pounds of firewood, fallen branches, twigs and dried roots for cooking and heating bath water. As firewood becomes more scarce, the villagers have to go further and further from Pura to find enough fuel. This is their energy crisis. It's one that affects most of the third world. Each family spends six hours a day watering and grazing their livestock. They have to find what grass they can along the edges of the roads and fields. The women and girls fetch the water from the pond. Two trips a day, two miles, one and a half hours in all. Total water consumption per head is four gallons a day, less than we use to flush the toilet. If you want water, we just uh, uh, turn a tap. If you want uh, light, uh, uh, we just uh, put on a switch. If you want to cook, we just uh, turn a gas stove or an electric uh, uh, stove. And all these things which we take for granted, uh, in, in terms of the village, uh, represent enormous amount of time. gathering firewood, fetching drinking water, grazing livestock, etc., have a very important link with education because uh, these poor families cannot afford to hire labor. And uh, we have found any number of children who are very bright, who want to go to school, and their parents want them to go to school, but they cannot because somebody in the home has to collect the firewood and fetch the drinking water. And the only people who can do this are these children. Since education may be a mechanism for lifting these families out of their conditions of poverty, we have a vicious circle where the constraints compel the children to drop out of education. In the last study that we did, we came to the conclusion that having a certain amount of land is not enough unless you also have the draft animal power and the human labor to operate that land. In fact, we felt that this might be one of the problems with the land reform program. If you give a person land and he doesn't have the draft animal power to operate it, has that come out uh, in this? Uh, yeah, it has come out very well. In fact, it's come out very well. It has come out very oh, well. Am I excited? I'm yes. really excited about that. In fact, the findings are really contrary to the general thinking. It's difficult to find scientists and engineers to work on such problems because of the value systems in science and engineering. What the industrialized countries consider as frontier areas has got a tremendous influence on scientists and engineers because if you go and work in an area like firewood stoves, the fear is that you'll get completely isolated. If those who assess you do not approve of these areas, then your career might suffer. The recent uh, uh, theories that is coming up is that the size of the family 
is decided by uh, the requirements of agricultural labor. That also is a point of view coming and it looks as if you will now start getting the crucial data which will test that hypothesis. Our experience has been that the problems that Astra has been looking at um, are just as scientifically challenging and technically sophisticated uh, as any of the other problems that we have been dealing with earlier in our career. Back in Bangalore, at the Indian Institute of Science, Astra tries out ideas on a laboratory scale. Professor Reddy has decided that Astra's first priority is to do something about Pura's cooking fuel problem. The villagers' traditional cooking stoves are made of mud and cost nothing. But analysis shows that they have a very low thermal efficiency, only about 5%. Most of the firewood energy, then, is wasted. The stoves can be modified, but then they cost too much. So Astra is looking for a more radical solution to the firewood problem. Biogas may be the answer. Biogas is a methane carbon dioxide mixture released by fermenting cattle dung. It's easy to collect and store in a simple gas holder floating in a pit of dung and water. The fermentation process also doubles the nitrogen content of the sludge, turning it into an even more valuable fertilizer. Biogas burners can be made from tin cans and used in existing village stoves. There are still technical problems to overcome, but Astra believes that biogas is a genuinely appropriate technology for Pura. Any plan that you make for the village must be based on its resources. The village has about 150 cattle, and this 150 cattle, according to the measurements made by my colleagues, give about one ton of fresh dung per day. And this dung is fermentable to give you about uh, 1,300 cubic feet of gas per day. And it looks as if this gas is more than enough to meet all the cooking energy needs of the village. It looks as if a biogas plant is the first step for a village like Pura. Astra's biogas plant is designed to solve the cooking problem, but the excess gas will power a modified diesel engine electric generator. It'll be run for 10 minutes a day to pump Pura's drinking water, and three hours each evening to provide every house in the village with electric light. Making gas from cattle dung isn't a new idea. There are some 20,000 small family-sized biogas plants in India. But only rich people can afford to buy them, and only cattle owners have the necessary dung to run them. In India, dung is a valuable resource. In Astra's scheme for the community, the villagers have decided that anyone who owns livestock bullocks, sheep or goats, will give their dung to the plant. Every family will have free gas piped to their house. But only those who contribute dung will get the fertilizer. Professor Reddy hopes this biogas scheme will be operating within a year or so. The whole scheme will cost around £3,500, financed by government grant. The poorer villagers have been patient with Astra's research. Now they're looking forward to seeing some results. Other villages too will be watching what happens in Pura. People have argued that we've been working for a long time and have not much to show for it. And I think uh, they are right. Uh, but it's important to understand the reasons uh, why this is the case. Uh, first of all, all of us who got into this program had to go through a fairly uh, major unlearning uh, process 
where we had to unlearn our attitudes, uh, where we found that uh, many of the types of expertise we had picked up in the past were irrelevant. We had to learn new types of expertise, so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, apart from this unlearning, uh, there was the whole problems, um, problem of getting to understand uh, the situation and really getting a feel for the actual problem. And this has taken uh, a long time. Village housing is another Astra research priority. Thatched roofs leak, they harbour reptiles, rats and termites, and they also catch fire. Villagers' aspirations have risen too and they simply don't want to live in mud and thatch houses anymore. Only richer villagers can afford the alternative, brick or stone walls with a tiled roof. Bricks can be made locally, but they need a lot of labor and huge amounts of scarce wood to fire them. Roofing tiles are expensive and have to be bought from the city. Astra is trying to develop cheaper but acceptable housing designs. It is essential to look into technologies which are based on local materials and which can be very much cheaper than the brick and tile house, which is accepted by most of the villagers as a satisfactory house. And the thatched house is generally not accepted as satisfactory because of the fire hazard and it, thatch has become too much of a symbol of poverty and uh, most of the landless laborers and Harijans would like to move away from it given the chance. Dr. Jagdish is experimenting with building techniques based on compressed mud blocks. 250 blocks a day can be turned out with a hand-operated press. One village perhaps could buy a machine and use it on a cooperative basis. The raw material, soil, is freely available. The blocks can be protected against erosion with a local lime cement. Astra's first house has a roof made from local bamboo, sheet polythene and dried mud. We're trying to solve two problems. It's keeping the money in so that they can spend it on their food and they can spend it on education. And we're trying to really bring down the energy uh, you know, utilization in the building. There's nothing, there's nothing being burnt, like the burnt bricks use so much thermal energy. This is, it's just sun dried. The roofing doesn't use tiles, so again, there's no thermal energy in it. It's just manual labor, which is really in abundance. Mr. Boroshetti is a landless laborer. He and his family built this house to Astra's design. Dr. Jagdish and Miss Lumba want to know if they have any suggestions for improvements. ಇಷ್ಟು ಕಿಟಕಿ ಇರಲ್ವಲ್ಲ he seems to be quite happy uh, his wife seems to complain a little about the smoke inside the house uh, he, she says that there is no place for the smoke to escape uh, that's a minor uh, detail in the design of the house and uh, we, we, we feel it has to be incorporated in the the modifications that have been incorporated in the uh, change designs I still have some reservations about the roof because uh, it uses uh, polythene sheet and uh, today polythene sheet uh, prices are going up uh, and there are a number of uh, minor points like uh, we do not know as yet about the durability of the roof material. So I would like to explore it and uh, improve its performance further. It's only the beginning. I'm satisfied because it's, we've started on something, you know, people haven't rejected it, they haven't boarded it up, they haven't burnt it down, they're living in it. They're willing to discuss the problems with us. Roof and the walls, and the smoke escapes, uh, when we studied, all our projects were based on hotels and commercial buildings and multi-stories, but that's not what the people need at all. I mean, I hate to quote the same figures, but 80% of the people are in the villages, and their needs are really, 
I'd feel guilty if I was working for those people who didn't need me. I'm going to take care of you, Swami. They're the ones who are 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 the मार कोला क्या अक्टूबर इली बुद्धिवंत्रो साल रो विद्या विद्या वंत्रा ला हल्ली जनांगे ला मूर जना इले आधा या कम में दूधन सप्लाई ला या बाद हार विल दे ना वो ये नो मार कोला खा लेते हो बच्चो आज इंदा ये ग्रानी कल इन्ले ये नार वंदु सहाय दूरतु ना वो बुद्धिवंत्रा की ना वो ग्रानी कला की ना � The people who work for Astra, very few of them came in committed. Many of them were chafing at the frustration and uh, irrelevance of many things that they were doing. So they decided to give these problems a try. I am quite sure that those who work with Astra are not more moral people than those who do not work on such problems. But one thing is clear, the problems themselves compel an interaction with the poorest rural people. One sees firsthand poverty of a type which one did not even imagine before. Then it is difficult not to be moved by this poverty. There is no purely technological solution to these problems. There have to be other things that go along with it. And those involve social changes, economic changes, and political changes. And the technology can only be a part of all that. But even if the other changes have all been accomplished, you'll still need this science and technology. And we know from our own experience that it takes a long, long time. And therefore, it's better that somebody starts working on these problems right now. Hey! 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 Hey!